get chopped out of the actual recording that gets posted. Um, so while Jed is perform is presenting, excuse me, um, everybody who is not speaking probably will have their cameras off and so that the webinar will spotlight uh, Jed as well as be muted. Um, or you know, obviously the same thing goes for introductions as well. And then once commentary comes up, be sure to turn your camera on and unmute yourself. I'm going to drop off this too and go on as an audience member. You don't need me here. <laughs> if, you, if you stop your video, you won't show up anywhere. But I if you won't show up at all? No, as long as you're you're muted. Make sure you're yeah, muted because if you unmute, then it will spotlight to you. Okay, bye. <laughs> and I think we also left ourselves open the option of ending a little bit earlier than that if it feels like the conversation isn't, you know, um, you know, sort of petering out because people do get a little tired on Zoom. So I think we can just sort of chat to each other um, and decide to wrap it up a little early if that feels like the best use of our time. Thanks, Amy. That, that's helpful. It'll, um, I had just been somehow, I'd had this in my mind for the same format that we used for the live lectures in the um, last year. And so um, I was expecting to be helping with bedtime starting at 6.30. So Should we just aim to end at 6.15? Ganesh, is that okay with you? Oh, no, 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 I, no, I would think that like maybe like closer to 6.45. Oh, right, sorry, 6.45, that's what I meant. Sorry, 6.15 would have been awfully early. <laughs> that works. Yeah, let's, let's do that then. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Works Thanks great. so much, guys. Let me, 5.32, just let me know if you guys are ready or... I'm no rush at all, but just you know. Thanks. Let's keep our opening remarks kind of brief then. Please. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start with an intro. So I'm going to introduce um, Jed, Amy, Ganesh, and, I'll, and I will verbally say I am passing the mic over to you, Jed. Oh, could you pass it over to me and I'll just say a word about LPE and then I'll pass it yeah. over to Jed? Yes, yeah, so let me update that. I'll pass it over to you. Great. That sounds perfect. Thank you. Great. Yeah, no problem. And then, and then during it, I'll just do mute and we'll just be disappeared throughout it and we'll just pop back up at the end. Great. Great. So I'll mute right now. All right, I'll go ahead and start the broadcast in about 10 seconds. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining ACS and Law Political Economy Project for an LPE approach to constitutional law featuring Jed Britton Bur Purdy with commentary from Amy Kuczynski and Ganesh Siraman. My name is Peggy Lee and I'm the Director of Chapters at the American Constitution Society. I am thrilled to welcome you to part three of our joint ACS and LPE series on Law and Political Economy 101. First, I wanna thank um, all the folks who worked so tirelessly to put this event together. Amy Kuczynski, Ganesh Sidaraman, Corinne Blaylock, Sabeel Rahman, Professor Angela Harris, Professor Jed Britton Purdy, and ACS staff for working so hard for, to put it to this series together. As we finish our last joint ACS and LP event of 2020, I do wanna acknowledge that ACS is approaching its 20th anniversary. We were founded after Bush v. Gore when it was abundantly clear that conservatives had set their aim on our independent judicial branch. ACS was founded on the principle that law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. We believe that the constitution is of the people, by the people, and for the people. We interpret the constitution based on its texts and against the backdrop of history and lived experience. Through a diverse nationwide network of progressive lawyers, law students, judges, scholars, and so many others, we work to uphold the Constitution in the 21st century by ensuring that law is a force to protect our democracy and for improving people's lives. These past four years have shown us that we can't afford to lose any more ground. We saw attack after attack and recognize what was at stake, clean air and water, reproductive autonomy, racial justice and equity, LGBTQ plus equality, the right to vote, workers' rights, access to a good education, and compassionate or even just common sense immigration system, and so much more. Our systems of checks and balances have also been tested. The courts, the very backstop of our democracy, have been threatened by the ruthless court capturing scheme of the right. We organized and we fought back. In 2017, ACS established the State Attorneys General Project, recognizing the unique role AGs play. We also continue to defend the rule of law through our nationwide network. ACS brought together some of the best legal minds to respond to threats to our democracy and separation of powers. We also organize our members to protect the right to vote. 
Throughout the nation, ACS members stepped up to meet the challenge two weeks ago. Our members volunteered as poll watchers, poll workers, worked the election protection hotline, and so much more. Over 20 ACS student chapters worked with their school administrations to create an election day civic engagement project. Our networks continue to engage in Georgia to protect the right to vote, and we continue to help curtail the spread of disinformation related to the 2020 election. If you're interested in engaging in these volunteer opportunities, please check out ACS, our ACS website, um, acslaw.org, and go to the volunteer page to learn more. We're so proud of the work of our network, um, and we know that the work has only just begun. We're ready to respond and advance the mission to ensure that laws are forced to improve the lives of all people. We're also working to develop a highly qualified pool of legal professionals dedicated to long-term positive change in a fair judiciary. Our chapters in conjunction with their local legal communities are identifying talented progressive lawyers at every stage in their careers and giving the support necessary to obtain influential positions at the state and federal level. Central to this work is drawing together our local legal community and prioritizing racial, ethnic, gender, sexual orientation, and practice area diversity. We're helping to ensure that the next administration is filled with people who will protect our democracy and improve people's lives. There's cause for hope, and we're excited to deliver in brighter days ahead. We hope you'll continue to engage with ACS and connect with our nationwide network of progressive advocates and build relationships that will support you for the rest of your career. We look forward to working with you to advocate for racial justice, gender equality, immigrants' rights, climate justice, and a constitution that works for all people. So now on to the event. Our program will begin with Jed Britton Purdy, who is the William S. Beinnicki Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He teaches and writes about environmental, property, and constitutional law, as well as legal and political theory. Professor Purdy's most recent book, This Land is Our Land, The Struggles for a New Commonwealth, explores how the land has historically united and divided Americans, shows how environmental politics has always been closely connected with issues of distribution and justice, and describes humanity as an infrastructure species. He is a co-founder of the Law and Political Economy blog and LP Initiative. He's a contributing editor for the American Prospect and serves on the editorial board of dissent. He clerked for Judge Pierre Laval, the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and received his AB from Harvard College and his JD from Yale Law School. We'll also hear from two more professors. Amy Chipsinski is a professor of law at Yale Law School, faculty co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership, and faculty co-director of the Collaboration for Research Integrity and Transparency. She's also a faculty co-director of the Law and Political Economy Project, co-founder of the LP blog. Her areas of research include information policy, intellectual property, uh, international law, and global health. She also served as a law clerk to Justices O'Connor and Breyer at the Supreme Court and to Judge Calabresi on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. She received her A.B. from Princeton University, a Master of Philosophy from Cambridge University, an M.A. from Queen Mary and Westfield College at University of London, and a J.D. from Yale Law School. We'll also hear from Ganesh Sidharaman, who's a professor of law, ACS faculty advisor, and director of the program in law and government at Vanderbilt Law School. He's also a member of the ACS Board of Directors and Board of Academic Advisors. He teaches and writes about constitutional law, the regulatory state, economic policy, democracy, and foreign affairs. He has been a longtime advisor to Senator Elizabeth Warren, serving, including serving as a senior advisor on her 2020 presidential campaign. He's also a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and the co-founder of the Great Democratic Initiative. He earned his AB in government at magna cum laude from Harvard College, a master's degree in political thought from Emanuel College, Cambridge, where he was the Lionel L. Jersey Harvard Scholar, and his JD Magna Cum Laude from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. Throughout the program, we do encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A box. I'll now pass the mic over to Amy. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so excited to get to hear from Jed this evening about uh, the law and political economy of constitutional law. And I uh, wanted to just say a brief word about the Law and Political Economy Project. Um, we are a much smaller and scrappier group that is organizing um, among faculty and students. And we have a number of student uh, groups around the country and a project, there's a number of affiliated projects too, like Appeal and the Law and Political Economy Journal, all trying to amplify work on political economy 
in contemporary law. Um, and um, the best way, I think, to keep up with what we're doing, if you're interested, is to check out our blog, uh, the Law and Political Economy blog, and also to check out our website. And just a brief note that we hope to have, <clears throat> there's a lot of, been a lot of interest in these sessions, and we um, anticipate that, you know, or we'll be trying to put together some other sessions uh, covering other areas like criminal law and labor law um, in the spring. So keep an eye out on our blog uh, for other sessions of this sort. And I'm going to turn it over to Jed and looking forward very much to his uh, his talk. Mm. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, um, Peggy and ACS for hosting us, um, Amy and Ganesh for participating, and to the um, folks at ACS who are um, behind the screen tonight, so to speak, making the, the tech work. Um, thanks everyone for doing this. And um, thanks to those of you in the audience who've made some time to spend with us this evening. So if we ask um, what constitutional law does, one answer we can give is that it works out and enforces key public principles what it means to respect people as free individuals, what it means for the law to treat people equally, and for a government to play these roles, what powers it needs to have and what role it should occupy in social life. So one way of understanding how we in the law and political economy network have engaged constitutional and other areas of law with respect to these fundamental issues is to insist on introducing into them questions about power and distribution in any definition of equality, freedom, or the role of the government. Who is exercising power over policy, over structure, over other individuals? How is that distributed? How are the benefits of the resources the law allocates and, and defines distributed? We try to understand this at a philosophical level, but also at a very concrete doctrinal level and to understand how law is the kind of um, micro form of power um, throughout the social order. So a lot of what I'm going to discuss tonight is how you might understand some of the themes and materials of a first year constitutional law course in relation to these questions. Before that, and in light of our current political situation and really the last four years that we've lived through together, I wanna to just pause over another dimension of constitutional law in the US. Because besides being oriented to what you might describe as the critical questions that I just named for you. Um, the Law and Political Economy Network, uh, to the extent that I, I don't speak for it, but I speak from it, I guess, um, has a moral orientation to democracy as the ultimate touchstone for thinking about the legitimacy of a legal order. What we mean by that exactly may differ but it's a point of defining overlap for us. So to think about the place of democracy in the US Constitution is to think about a rather different and at least as foundational aspect of what a constitution does, which is to provide a set of rules and institutions for translating collective action into political power that is a way of determining who controls the state and what they may do with it. So when we talk about the US Constitution, it seems to me that we should maybe talk about it a little more than we do in terms of James Madison's claim that among other things, it achieves the total exclusion of the people from government in their collective capacity. That is that no decision in the system is actually taken by national majorities. That is to say that at key points, ours is an anti-democratic constitution in principle and by design. When right-wingers say, as they like to do increasingly, we're not a democracy, the immediate progressive response is sometimes to say, at least when we're feeling Twitter-brained, 
look what terrible things they say. But maybe it would be better to say it's true and what can we do about it? After all, it's been very clear that it's true for the last 20 years. We've had two presidencies elected against the popular vote, both of them with some catastrophic human results. Trump may reveal or confirm a lot of bad things about the country, but not exactly about its political majorities. He never won a popular vote, even though he came perilously close to winning the Electoral College twice. Mitch McConnell can control the Senate while his party has the support of a good deal less than half the people who vote in Senate elections. And the Supreme Court, of course, has the last word on the fundamental meaning of law in the US. And it's these institutional features of our constitutional order that create the structural incentive to produce a minority rule party, an incentive that the GOP has responded to. So ultimately, I think, and here I speak uh, only for myself, uh, very much from rather than for the LPE network, I think progressives need ultimately to explore the conditions that made it possible 100 years ago to adopt constitutional amendments that changed the distribution of US power in basic ways, like women's votes, direct election of the Senate, which had previously been appointed by state legislatures, authorization of an income tax. We should be talking about the Electoral College and the Senate at the level of constitutional design. I think we should even be talking about Article 5, the amendment process itself, but making it easier for national majorities to change the Constitution. I may come back to say a little more about this at the end, or given our time constraints, I may leave it for discussion. Um, I now want to move on to constitutional doctrine. The standard thing to say about the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court has been for most of the last 80 years that the Constitution has nothing to say about the economy. It's conventional to quote Justice Holmes's now canonical claim in his dissent in Lochner v. New York, 1905, to the effect that the Constitution adopts no economic theory. Meanwhile, while constitutional law has tended to evacuate or ignore economic themes. In those areas of the economy, such as contracts and property and antitrust, excuse me, those areas of law that are taken to be about the economy, the goal as those fields are taught in law school, explored in legal scholarship, and to a considerable extent adjudicated, the goal of those fields has been taken to be some version of economic efficiency which, however you cash it out in theoretical terms, has tended in institutional practice to mean trying wherever possible to set up the law so that people can enter into voluntary bargains on the market. My guess is that some of you have already encountered this in your first year property contracts or torts classes. Others of you will know it well from your upper level courses by now. So we in LPE have said that when we talk about the way the law shapes the economy, we shouldn't only center the various versions of efficiency. We should insistently center questions of distribution, who has what, who gets what, who controls the wealth. And we should center questions of power because having wealth gives you control of other people's time and that accumulates to control over their lives. That you could call personal power. Also, concentrated wealth entails other kinds of power, which we could call structural. Amazon, for example, has a lot of influence over the retail market in the country, and all the more so in COVID time. Facebook and Twitter famously have a lot of influence over the information people get. And ultimately, wealth translates into political power. As we know, the wealthy get a disproportionate voice in making the rules that we all live with. Now, we LPE people have sought to bring this orientation into conversation with constitutional law, which, as I said, has tended to drive out economic considerations by insisting that we should think about the economic dimensions of constitutional adjudication 
and that we should think about it in terms of the dimensions of distribution and power that I just named, as we should in um, classically economic areas such as property and antitrust. So what does constitutional law have to do with economic distribution and power? What do you see when you look at it through that lens? It turns out quite a lot. The first big thing constitutional law has done is to define constitutional equality in a narrow way that means that some of the deepest forms of inequality are perfectly constitutional. Since Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, the doctrine of equality has been probably the most powerful principle in constitutional law. It's contributed to dismantling official racial segregation, forbidding different treatment of women and men, establishing the right to same-sex marriage. But in a watershed period between 1970 and 1978, the court resisted what would have been one of the furthest reaching applications of the equality principle to take on what we might think of as structural inequality. First, it held in 1970 that there was no meaningful substantive constitutional protection of access to public benefits. It had seemed as recently as 1969 that the justices might be moving toward holding that there was a fundamental constitutional interest in family support or access to medical care. Justice Brennan introduced the idea in much the same way that he was introducing the idea of gender equality in the same years. The two ideas were pretty much equally unprecedented in constitutional law. One bloomed and the other faded. Second, the court held in 1973 that there was no constitutional interest in equal or adequate funding for public education. That highly unequal funding across school districts was just fine. It rejected arguments that the constitutional rights to free speech and voting should imply a constitutional interest in schooling to prepare to exercise those rights effectively. Third, in the same 1973 case, Rodriguez v. San Antonio School District, the court ruled that there was no special constitutional scrutiny for policies that burden poor people. This would have been the doctrinal basis for courts to look into the effect on the poor of, for example, voting laws that penalize frequent moving, which poorer people tend to do, or restrict voting to working hours on a Tuesday when it's often hard for low wage workers to show up. It would have meant scrutiny for property tax systems that enable wealthy places to maintain rich schools while poor places can barely keep theirs running. After 1973, there was no basis to claim that economic inequality presented a constitutional problem, even when public policy was actively reproducing it in institutions that are quite central to the shaping of people's lives and prospects. Then in 1976, the court sharply restricted the reach of its most powerful equality doctrine, the principle of non-discrimination on the basis of race. The question was whether a policy raises questions of constitutional equality when, even though it doesn't treat people differently on the basis of race, it persistently produces different results in the aggregate along racial lines. The case, Washington v. Davis, was a challenge to a hiring policy that included a verbal aptitude test that statistically scored black applicants less well than white ones. The test scores had not been shown to correspond to job performance. The court ruled that the policy was fine unless it was adopted with the purpose of disadvantaging black applicants, but that is, unless it intentionally in produced disparate results on the basis of race and was motivated by the pursuit of that result. So this conclusion made the race class intersection constitutionally invisible. Then, as now, average black household wealth was about one-tenth the wealth of the average white household. Black families tended to live in neighborhoods with less well-funded schools, where household wealth had been driven down by redlining and other discriminatory practices. These dimensions of inequality grew out of the core of the Jim Crow system, which was both racial apartheid and economic subordination, with Black Americans pressed legally and extra-legally toward the most vulnerable and least stable forms of work. If policies that put unequal burdens on non-white people had been opened to constitutional challenge, governments would at least have had to explain themselves when their policies kept things unequal. <clears throat> 
there would have been built-in pressure toward policy that uprooted an inheritance of inequality. Instead, the court issued a blank check for policies that reproduced inequality. One way to think about these decisions is in terms of the difference between two ideas or metaphors, the constitutional foreground and the constitutional background. The foreground is the aim of, is the domain of overt official decisions that have to be justified in light of constitutional principles, like discriminating on the basis of race or regulating on the basis of race. The background is just there, taken as given, constitutionally inert, constitutionally unproblematic. What happens there raises no constitutional questions. These decisions pressed the following questions into the background, economic inequality and the intersection between economic inequality and racial subordination. Pressing these themes into the constitutional background meant there was no obligation to address them in constitutional terms. It also amounted to a constitutional naturalization of the results of American capitalism. The place you've ended up as a result of generations of American racial capitalism and a series of versions is the starting point here for constitutional inquiry, rather than presenting problems of constitutional equality in itself. Here's another example of constitutional doctrine naturalizing the market. It's in abortion rights. In 1973, in Roe v. Wade, the court established a right to choose an abortion as an aspect of personal liberty under the 14th Amendment's due process clause. In the seven years that followed, however, it ruled that this right did not require any scrutiny of federal health programs that denied funding to abortion while offering it for live births. These policies were aimed at discouraging women from exercising the constitutional right to choose abortion. In cases involving other such rights, the court had held and would continue to hold that people could not be induced to give up a constitutional right by the government's offering or withholding benefits. For instance, a state couldn't condition welfare payments on recipients giving up the right to vote or student loans on a promise not to tweet about the presidential election. But here, a policy that structured its spending to discourage women from exercising what the court had then called a fundamental constitutional right was waved through. I think part of the reason was sexism about a right exercised specifically about women. Another part though, was the assumption that wherever economic life in the market has washed women up is where the constitutional analysis of their situation begins. Like with the race class intersection, the economic situation of the person who might exercise the abortion right fades into the constitutional background. Your economic situation isn't the law doing something to you in this picture. It's just life outside the constitution's reach, outside the reach of the principle of equality. Of course, the history of women under American patriarchy was also an economic history, centrally an economic history of being denied opportunity shunted into lower paying and often less secure jobs, having the essential labor of social reproduction defined as outside the domain of economic value. And of course, to return to abortion, whether you can exercise a right to a medical procedure in a market economy depends on whether someone will pay the provider. There was a range of possible ways of grappling constitutionally with American inequality. Through access to public funding and services, through constitutional attention to class, or through the race class intersection and through the recognition that exercising rights takes resources. In these cases, each of these paths was blocked. Constitutional equality came to mean simply not being subjected to differential treatment on the explicit basis of race or another suspect classification. Ironically, this came to mean that race conscious policies like affirmative action did come in for constitutional scrutiny and may still be invalidated. While the ways that inequality was woven into American social and economic life without ever having to name race or sex were treated as unproblematic constitutional backdrop. So in these ways, constitutional law has participated in protecting the economy 
as a domain where intersectional forms of inequality are produced and reproduced. In this way, it has dovetailed with and reinforced the legitimacy, the naturalness of the view of primarily, as it were, economically oriented areas of law, like antitrust, property, um, that law's role or purpose is to conform in rough outline with an ideal of market ordering. So that's one thing constitutional law has done. In other ways, it has affirmatively protected the exercise of economic power by defining that power as within the scope of a protected constitutional right. The leading example is the court's use of the First Amendment's right to free speech to protect election spending and other advertising and commercial transactions from public regulation. Even before law school, many of you had probably heard of Citizens United v. FEC, 2010 case that held that corporate campaign spending was constitutionally protected free speech and couldn't be prohibited. Fewer non-lawyers have heard of Buckley v. Vallejo, which was the 1976 decision that put the court on the road to Citizens United. In Buckley, the court ruled that campaign spending is protected speech that receives the highest level of constitutional protection and that the Constitution doesn't tolerate campaign regulations that try to establish equal voice or influence among citizens by limiting spending. The court said that such efforts at uh, leveling the playing field have no role in our constitutional system. The court struck down limits on third party independent expenditures in campaigns, think Sheldon Adelson or Tom Steyer, and on candidates using their own money to support their campaigns. Think Mike Bloomberg, although it's not a great example on behalf of plutocracy. The law that Buckley v. Vallejo gutted was an attempt to build national politics around small donors and volunteers. Besides Citizens United, Later cases have struck down public financing that uses donation matching funds to level up opponents of wealthy candidates who are self-funding their campaigns. There's some evidence doctrinally that limits on campaign donations are also at risk, though those limits are relatively unimportant, arguably, because there are so many ways to avoid them. So what do these First Amendment cases do? <clears throat> Well, they address the relationship between capitalism and democracy, a very high level of abstraction. They pose the question whether there's a constitutional right to translate predictably and pervasively unequal wealth into political voice and influence, at least influence unless your voice is very annoying, like Bloomberg again. And these cases say that there is such a right. Because markets tend to produce inequality that, as I suggested a moment ago, compounds over time, this amounts to saying that under our constitutional order, political voices will be unequal and will tend to get more unequal over time. So how did the court justify these opinions? What conception of democracy was it advancing? When you read a case like Citizens United, one thing you see is that the justices are assimilating political decision making, specifically voter decisions, to consumer decision making as modeled in the high theory of neoclassical economics. Advertising, political spending, is treated as being good for everyone because if elections are just one more marketplace, in spending, advertising are ways of getting information to voters who are rational consumers of political choices, of political alternatives, then spending is a tribute to the rationality and the ultimate sovereignty of the people. It's just helping them out to see what's on the table so that they can make a sensible choice. In this idealized, literal, free marketplace of ideas, political spending would preserve what the court per Justice Kennedy called it 
had called it in Buckley, excuse me, that was not Justice Kennedy, um, but I think, I think um, he quoted it in Citizens United, if I recall correctly, a republic where the people are sovereign. So that's one level of the analysis, a, an assimilation of political decision-making to market decision-making of voters to consumers and of political spending as a form of power-free provision of information rather than the exercise of the power to shape discourse, shape alternatives, shape attitudes and ideas. This is a kind of willful naivete that I think would only be possible under the general and deep influence of market style thinking and so much of our conversation about law and politics. But there's another layer to the campaign spending cases as well, which is um, a little less bright and loud. And you have, to, you have to poke around a little in the opinions to get it. And I think this is a very um, a deep skepticism of politics and a mistrust of majority rule and, and specifically of the activity of the modern state especially the modern regulatory state. So I pointed out that the law that was gutted in Buckley, which was a post Watergate reform intended to um, shake corruption out of the system, um, was designed to favor the parties and candidates who could muster large volunteer networks, get a lot of small donors that tended to be the Democratic Party it curtailed the influence of um, big spenders who tended to be businessmen and financial elites keen to get involved in politics, whether as independent spenders or as candidates. And as far as the justices were concerned, this legislative effort to shape the field of political contest in one direction rather than another looked like picking winners. It looked like the current Congress trying to determine the composition of the next Congress by setting up the, um, the race course for the, um, for the next round of elections. And so the court advanced its view of campaign spending as enforcing a certain kind of neutrality on the part of the legislative branch, preventing it from picking winners, preventing the political entrenchment of current majorities and the interest groups that they're aligned with. This, I think, was a false neutrality, a perniciously false neutrality. It might avoid political entrenchment, but what it gives you instead is class entrenchment. I've already, I think, explained in, in brief how that's the case. So the constitutional developments I've been describing, how did they happen? So here we get to a very important question. How does constitutional law change? Here, some of us in the LPE network have uh, tended to give a two-part answer. First, constitutional law is deeply political. It involves competing ideas of freedom and equality, competing visions of the role of government in the political community. Dominant visions emerge and get consolidated in constitutional doctrine because of the balance of political forces. Very broadly, in the cases I've been describing, we see the defeat of what you might think of as a social democratic or egalitarian constitutionalism that saw freedom and equality as depending in essential ways on your material situation and the role of the state as being to manage and improve that situation. In the same cases, we see the victory of a neoliberal constitutionalism that sees freedom and equality in highly individual terms abstracted from most material conditions. Question for this narrow vision of constitutional equality that has prevailed is simply whether the state treats you differently from other people. An essential difference between the two constitutional visions, as I was saying before, is whether the economic marketplace is naturalized as background or brought into play as part of the constitutional foreground. 
So the second part of the LPE approach to con of this LPE approach today, mine, to constitutional change is to ask about the politics that's producing constitutional law. What's the interplay between American racial capitalism on the one hand and democratic movements and electoral strength on the other? That is, how do the economy and the state interact in producing constitutional law? Take the cases I've been describing. They emerged at the end of and in reaction to three decades of widely shared growth and expanded social protections. Those decades brought the flattest distributions of wealth and income the country had ever seen and a strong role for organized labor in managing the national economy and distributing its fruits. They also brought the greatest 20th century success of the black freedom struggle, which was often in the 60s about economic redistribution, jobs, even capitalism itself, not just formal equal treatment. After all, the March on Washington was the march for jobs and freedom, and King himself ended up a democratic socialist shortly before his, in the years before his assassination. For the center right in these decades, and for the spokespersons of owners and managers, these decades of growing equality presented a threat. They warned that rising wages, public spending, union power, bureaucratic regulation were undermining profits and free enterprise. Famous and influential economists like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman argued for cutting back the power of unions and of government redistribution to preserve market discipline and the libertarian freedom to invest in businesses and hire and fire workers. Business elites listened and so did corporate lawyers. In a 1971 memo to the US Chamber of Commerce, Lewis Powell, who was then a lawyer practicing corporate law in Virginia, called on American business to make a full court press for what he called the preservation of the system, meaning free enterprise, his term itself, to preserve capitalism itself. Powell articulated in that memo the neoliberal view of constitutional order, quote, the threat to the enterprise system also is a threat to individual freedom. Freedom as a concept is indivisible, as the experience of the socialist and totalitarian states demonstrate the contraction and denial of economic freedom, meaning market freedom, is followed inevitably by governmental restrictions and other cherished rights. In other words, you have to protect the market to protect liberty and equality understood in this way. A few months later, Powell was nominated by Richard Nixon for a seat on the Supreme Court. In 1973, he wrote the opinion in San Antonio v. Rodriguez, the case ruling there was no constitutional protection for the poor, no violation of equal protection and unequal school funding schemes. He was instrumental in shaping the court's market protecting First Amendment jurisprudence, including a founding a line of cases protecting advertising and data transactions as speech and undercutting government regulation of the tobacco, alcohol, and pharmaceutical industries marketing practices. He was at the intellectual center of the movement to define the principle of equality to exclude structural disparities. And he wrote the first opinion subjecting affirmative action to severe constitutional scrutiny in 1978. The link between Powell's memo in the Supreme Court's turn in the 1970s, wasn't a conspiracy except in the sense that all political organizing is a kind of open conspiracy. But it was very important ideological work. At any time in US history, the Constitution's principal concepts, liberty, equality, political accountability, have the meanings that judicial interpretation assigns to them. These interpretations, even when they're styled originalist, always respond to the political movements and crises and felt imperatives of the time as they're inflected by the elite lawyers who populate the court. So if we're going to think about alternatives for the Constitution, we should think of those alternatives in relation to our political moment. Here are some thoughts for the purpose of discussion about places we might like to get hold of and shift constitutional doctrine, should we ever have that opportunity again. The centerpiece, I think, should be a constitutionalism of strong democracy. Fighting against the vote suppression efforts of the Republican Party, Democrats have been recognizing vividly for the last few years the extent of disenfranchisement 
of former felons, incarcerated people, Puerto Rican citizens, and people whose jobs and family responsibilities keep them from the polls on any given Tuesday. In the mid-1960s, the Supreme Court announced a fundamental right to vote and established the one-person, one-vote rule. But as the court's grown more conservative, it's upheld voter suppression laws, or voted the Voting Rights Act, and in a quietly momentous decision in 1974, held felon disenfranchisement constitutional. So we should push for a world where constitutional principle would mean restoring voting rights to the more than 6 million people who can't vote because of a previous crime, where it would mean scrupulously examining laws that limit ballot access for young and non-white voters. Maybe we could revisit the century old cases that authorized the US to govern permanent territories of non-citizens, decisions that had explicitly racist and nationalist foundations and held that as American and, and um, could push to hold instead that as American citizens, Puerto Ricans must be offered the opportunity to be full members of the political process. These reforms would tend to benefit progressive candidates, but they're also matters of democratic principle. Best role for constitutional adjudication is to help maintain fair rules for the political process. And nothing should be more basic than the right of citizens to form their own government. Second, progressive candidates and activists have been pressing for a new conception of economic citizenship, universal health and family leave, free higher education, access to union membership and other workplace protections against the power of owners and bosses. That kind of activism, which again has only intensified in the face of the depredations of COVID and the indifference of the national government, would inform a constitutionalism of economic citizenship. For decades, as I've been saying, the Supreme Court has ignored and reinforced economic power. We should insist that adherence to constitutional principle means recognizing that people aren't meaningfully free in the economy unless they have some security, some material security, and some option to say no, to say no to an employer. That is, they have some power. What might that mean concretely? It might mean protecting unions as essential institutions of worker power. It might mean treating policies like the Medicaid expansion that the court hamstrung in 2012 as essential efforts to achieve economic security and obviously constitutional in the same way that core civic institutions like jury duty are obviously constitutional. It might mean holding that federal law doesn't authorize arbitration agreements where workers sign away basic protections because those protections are part of economic citizenship. Instead of assuming that the law exists to uphold private and often unequal agreements, it might mean assuming that its job is to help protect inequality. Excuse me, correct inequality. I um, <clears throat> misspoke. Economic citizenship also has important meaning for abortion rights. It's time to reopen the question whether restrictions on abortion funding are compatible with respect for the abortion right. A third goal should be a constitutionalism of criminal justice or a constitutionalism to confront the carceral state. Activists and campaigns have raised over the last five years essential questions about policing in the prison system. An earlier generation of court rulings established the constitutional right to a lawyer for criminal defendants and protections against certain kinds of arbitrary and abusive treatment by the police. Today, we need a constitutional vision for a new generation of issues. Maybe contending that it violates due process of law to languish in jail just because you can't make bail. Maybe arguing that constitutional equality is offended when white and non-white people or poor and wealthy people have pervasively different experiences of criminal justice, of the police, of incarceration. Progressives are winning important victories on these fronts by electing reformist prosecutors. And maybe that's the main way that we need to push these issues forward. The constitutional rulings can help to press change throughout the system and not just in sympathetic cities and states. The core work of constitutional law is organizing and disciplining the government's coercive power. 
And whether that power reinforces racial and economic inequalities or helps to neutralize them is one of the most basic questions for a legal system. Fourth would be a constitutionalism that respects the rights of non-citizens. In response to President Trump's nativism in the last four years, we've seen a new wave of mobilization and solidarity with migrants that's highlighted the extreme legal, economic vulnerability of millions of undocumented residents and workers. Courts have long tolerated different treatment of foreigners than of US citizens and authorized residents. But the family separation crisis at the border highlighted the American archipelago of lawlessness that asylum seekers and unauthorized border crossers face. Little meaningful process, opaque and arbitrary decisions with life or death consequences. The right to due process of law should apply, does apply notionally to everyone in the power of the United States government and not just citizens. A decent jurisprudence would both strike down transparently cruel policies like family separation and require a decent, intelligible, and transparent process to decide on the rights of non-citizens. It would be much more expensive than the present system, but legitimacy of this kind isn't free. So I've been talking about what we might, as progressives, want judges to do with constitutional doctrine. And I guess I should just note that this is an exceedingly fraught and difficult time in which to speak in this optimistic register about what constitutional adjudication could possibly do for us. Much of the moderately progressive doctrine that we teach in our constitutional law cases may be on its way to becoming historical now. We may be uh, approaching a watershed era of conservative jurisprudence in which the progressive attitude toward the Supreme Court will more closely resemble that of the 1930s before the crisis of the New Deal or the 1910s and early 20s when the court was, the, um, was a leading roadblock to progressive labor law and other um, sorts of urgent reform. And if that's right, then I think we will be pushed decisively in the direction that I advocated a bit at the beginning, trying to push a more majoritarian, a more properly democratic allocation of power within this constitutional system and trying to make the footprint of a reactionary and anti-majoritarian court, contingently reactionary, but essentially anti-majoritarian, um, smaller. At the same time, progressives who hope to control power and govern should have a vision of what we want the courts to do consistent with our broader commitments. And I hope the examples I've given um, are at least some concrete picture of what a counterpoint to the neoliberal jurisprudence that I've been regretting would look like. I have a few more thoughts, but I also am conscious that we're wrapping up in just a little more than 20 minutes, and I want to make sure that both Amy and Ganesh, who very generously agreed to participate in the conversation, have plenty of room to speak. So I am going to pause here, mute myself, and Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Jed, for that terrific lecture. Um, as we often do here, uh, we encourage everyone uh, to, if you haven't yet, put in a question into the Q&A um, that's that's available here. Um, we're going to take questions, uh, and Amy and I will will uh, channel all of you um, and channel your questions and, and offer them up to uh, to Jed for for answering. Um, and we may throw in some of our own questions uh, as well. But um, we really think this is a great opportunity for all of you to ask the the burning questions uh, that you're interested in um, in having answers to. Um, so I'll, I'll just start off, um, Jed, and and uh, ask you a question. Um, that comes from Natasha. Um, and Natasha asks, um, 
how does an issue move from constitutional background into the constitutional foreground? You know, a lot of what you've talked about, just to explicate a little bit on her question, is are, are things that, um, you know, are not necessarily in the constitutional foreground at the moment, um, and in some cases may not be in the public foreground even at the moment, um, or at least to the degree necessary uh, for them to become constitutional uh, in the way that you've described. So how does that process work? How do things go from background to foreground? And I think you're on mute right now. Thanks, Kanish. <laughs> so I am. Um, so um, the examples that are really vivid to us at the beginning, by the way, thanks, Natasha, and hi. Um, the examples that are really vivid to us in our um, current era of jurisprudence are cases where questions that have long been regarded as decided by some combination of nature and social norms as being just obvious, so obviously the way they are that an artificial principle like constitutional equality could have nothing to say about them, have been disrupted by non-judicial, non-constitutional, political and social and cultural developments that have made it impossible for enough, impossible with a straight face for enough people to continue pretending that they just have to be the way they are um, for things to go on as they had been. So to be more concrete, I'm talking about the way that the court in the mid 70s, really relatively late in the political efflorescence of second wave feminism that have comes to understand that hundreds of years of talking about the family as a natural phenomenon in which gender hierarchy is just determined by the ways that men and women are and by the role that the family has to play in the social order, suddenly launches instead on what is in some ways arguably the, the most um, anti-subordination branch of constitutional equality doctrine, um, a branch that is it's articulated by Justice Ginsburg in the U.S. v. Virginia case involving the Virginia Military Institute, um, tries to make the principle of constitutional equality a kind of uh, permanent principle for the uprooting or remaking of our very ideas of what gender is, of who women and men are, um, and, what, and what they do. Um, so in those cases, there's a sort of process of, of, of denaturalization or unsettling that happens outside the courts, but which the courts then can take up and respond to. Um, so, that's, that's, that's the answer that, that we sort of know about. And I think that's, it's actually also true in the ways that the court sense of the salience of issues like to be, con uh, to be concrete again, uh, money bail and the kind of extensive imprisonment that happens from people just sitting around away from their families, away from their lives or their work for weeks or longer because um, they can't, generate the um, money to, to um, go out on bail between initial charges and, and trial um, has sort of become salient to the courts after having become salient as an issue of political mobilization, um, including in the progressive prosecutors' fights that I was talking about. So I think the, the courts tend to be on the receiving end more than the generating end of these changes, but can still do good work with them. I'll try to be to be briefer because I see we're getting uh, a few questions now. Great. Um, so I think uh, next we'll we'll go to a question from Evan, um, who's asking you to talk about the ways in which public discourse on equality and social justice are divorced from the terms of constitutional law. So what does it mean that the Constitution occupies so little space in contemporary debates about racism? And inequality, what can be done about this other than amending the Constitution? How do we bring a different kind of analysis into the picture? Or should, is that what we need to do? Um, so go for yeah. it. <clears throat> so I, I guess the, 
very short version is that it seems um, perfectly natural to me that given the way the Constitution has been interpreted and enforced in, in recent decades, um, that there would be no particular appeal to a sort of ideal version of constitutional principle in the mobilizations um, that, we've, that we've seen in the last year and in recent years, because why would you go there? Um, what would be the point? In a sense, you wanna go straight to the lived principles of, um, the, of the ways that equality and freedom are being concretely violated where you are. So I guess I think it's, it's the, the, the burden is on courts and lawyers um, to find ways to learn from and respond collaboratively to those kinds of mobilizations um, rather than to sort of expect the specifically constitutional sort of proto-technical um, a, appeal to come from there. Um, so I, it's, it's, on, it's on us, I guess, is the thought. Thanks, Evan. Great, so um, we have a question now from Alon. Um, and Alon says, and I guess this, this question comes from, uh, uh, your, your or is directed to your comment uh, that you may not speak for LPE, but uh, come from LPE. So, um, Alon asks, what is the proper role of evaluating market effects in LPE analysis? Should market effects play no role, be subservient to democratic effects, or still be a primary vector to analyze? Great, so it's, so it's a terrific question. So how did law and economics, which has been in the background of what I've been discussing, um, become so influential? There are lots of stories to tell. Some have to do with right-wing uh, networks of investment in law and economics scholarship. Some have to do with the way that law and economics produced a very modular um, and easy to learn, although potentially sophisticated style of legal analysis, which produced generations of replicable work for, um, for law professors. Uh, but another reason, and in some ways the most uh, appealing or kind of straightforwardly creditable, is that there really are trade-offs um, in whatever we do with our time and our resources. At the, high methodological level economists are not wrong about this. Incentive compatibility really does make a difference to how the aspirations of policy play out in reality and unintended or perverse consequences of well-intended policy um, are real. So should we ignore that because we think the policy is trying to do the right thing? Um, by no means, I would say rather what we would, again, this is, this is just me speaking from LP, but I think the position that's sort of essential to get to is that markets are always created by a set of legal institutional decisions, including the definition and allocation of property rights and powers of contract. And then of course, far more sophisticated and regulatorily intense areas like finance. Um, and markets of whatever kind should be thought of as policy instruments fundamentally. They represent the institutional expression of decisions, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit because they're buried so deep in um, historical legal forms and practice that we're gonna coordinate our time and allocate resources according to some version of marginal returns rather than some other version like human need, some other imperative or, or, or standard like human need, politically determined need. Um, so it may be very appropriate for uh, political community to decide that some key areas of its shared life are going to be organized on market terms. Um, and the kind of analysis you're pointing to 
gives us some kinds of reasons to do that. Um, I think the key thing at a certain level of abstraction is just to understand that it is a decision of that sort. Um, it is not market organizing, market organization that is, is not a um, natural or conceptually or practically necessary or exclusive way of organizing ourselves and should not preempt, but should only participate in a kind of broader normative and political conversation about what we're doing. Great. Um, I'm going to, looking at the time because we wanted to finish by 645, I'm going to combine Michael's two questions, um, which are both really wonderful questions about, you know, kind of how radical we ought to be in our thinking about countering counter majoritarianism. So on the one hand, should we be taking on the, the institution of judicial review itself and the precedent of Marbury? Um, because courts are counter majoritarian institutions. And then second, should constitutional conventions be how we're thinking about proceeding to really fundamentally reestablish the terms of our democracy? Um, both of these intersect with questions that I wanted to ask you, Jed. And I guess one, a third thing I thought I might put on the table is, you know, I think there's lots of, um, lots of interest and you started out with a sort of what Pam Carlin, I think is called the new counter-majoritarian difficulty, right? The counter-majoritarian difficulty of our democratic institutions of the Senate, of the Electoral College. And how do you think about the balance of the problem between say, um, the problems in the courts versus the problem of the new counter-majoritarian difficulty? Is that something, um, uh, you know, ought one have more priority than the other, for example, in our thinking? So if you can add that one in there somehow, while answering these other two um, majestically large questions, yeah. feel free. That's, um, <clears throat> that's, thank you, um, Amy and Michael, so much for that. And I see the questions are building up faster than um, I'm answering them. So, I increasingly think, Amy, to the third part of your question, that the other counter-majoritarian institutions, um, which are more hardwired in the constitutional order, particularly the Senate, than judicial review, which after all has been around for a long time, but is not named in Article Three, are um, are, are more are more serious. Only um, the court can only strike down so much. The Senate can fail to do everything we need. Um, so that suggests, I think, if we if we take that analysis seriously, that we either that we're basically two paths. One is kind of analogous to the British reforming the House of Lords by bits and pieces over the 20th century. Add some states, try to create political pressure for the Senate to amend its rules, um, make it less and less. Uh, fully co-equal or more and more a quasi-representative body. Um, the other path is to go directly to constitutional amendment uh, and to start thinking seriously about it would, what it would mean to raise the flag of convention. Um, I really do think that those of us who identify ourselves as Democrats in the small d sense, um, if we are resistant to the idea that the Constitution itself should be more open to democratic amendment, should ask ourselves why and whether we're sure that we don't want to push for a movement to open it up. I think that's right in practical terms because the hardwired it's plausible in practical terms because the hardwired institutional anti-majoritarianism um, we're talking about is big and consequential enough. It also might be true in principled terms. Because if you think about what makes plausible the idea that a constitution is a sort of ultimate or, or democratic uh, document, that it's an act of popular sovereignty as the conceit of our constitution has it Two things have to be true. There has to be, the Constitution as it exists has to be authorized by a majority or supermajority, a, a proper fraction of the political community that has to live with it. And second, and just as important, there has to be 
an ongoing way for the generation that today has to live with that fundamental law to either affirm and continue with it or to change it. Um, the fact that our constitution is so difficult to amend and that our culture of constitutional change has been so thoroughly judicialized, taken together, um, have made it effectively the case that the Constitution has experienced as a kind of inherited fate. Um, and I'm not at all sure that, um, that Democrats should, should stand still for that. So I think um, judicial review itself should be on the table of progressive uh, strategy and vision casting uh, and that conventions are also appropriately part of that conversation. So I, I think we may have uh, time for just one more. Um, and uh, I want to ask a question uh, from Kathleen, um, who says, do you see a way for constitutional interpretation to move from the judicial branch into the political sphere, where mobilization can exercise greater influence without a second reconstruction or at least a constitutional crisis uh, that may be more dangerous than the current moment? Is there a way to do this without capture by business interests? And, and I might just add to that, um, you know, how do you think about constitutional arguments in the political sphere in a highly polarized environment where there's not just a single information ecosystem in which constitutional arguments might uh, find space in, the, in politics, but there are two, um, or maybe more than two, but at least. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think through that issue? So I guess the very first thing to say is a kind of uh, postscript, uh, Ganesh, to what you just observed about the um, multiple information ecosystems that, that people are working in. Um, I think it's a perverse feature of our, our anti-majoritarian constitutional system that it's produced this setting, the situation in which it's possible for two deeply divided camps, each to understand themselves as embodying the proper majority and legitimate government, governing power in the country. Um, crudely put, the, the right, the, the Republicans, because they are able for reasons of constitutional disproportionality to con decisively control the um, institutions of national government much of the time. Uh, and second, the um, center left of the Democrats because they do in fact persistently, we in fact persistently um, represent national majorities. I think if you can't bring those two into, some, into a closer alignment, you have the kinds of materials of perennial crisis and a kind of open invitation to a politics of delegitimation. Um, I don't think that accounts for all of the pathologies that we're living with right now, but it certainly um, facilitates and fosters them. Um, I, I don't actually think there's a lack of um, constitutional argument in um, political venues, especially on the right, especially on the right because the constitution is sort of revealed in, at present as the means to achieve and maintain counter-majoritarian or minoritarian rule. Um, but I think this, I don't know that I can put this well as a last observation, um, but I'll do my best. The scholars in the last few decades um, have been very interested in constitutional discourse, democratic constitutionalism, popular constitutionalism have frequently been taken to mean everyone talks about the constitution and then sometimes the courts will listen. Um, and that's how the people get their feedback. Um, I think that's fine 
but I think we have to be a little um, more emphatic about the central place of the institutional locus of decision. Like ultimately the question is, is not about talking and listening. The question is about who has the decisive word in the institutions of the state. And um, that's where we're working uphill now. Um, that's not everything I hoped to say, but it's, it's um, that th those, those are um, my thoughts about that. Um, Kathleen, thanks a lot. Um, and, um, and everyone, um, Peggy and Ganesh and Amy, thank you, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, and um, thanks everyone for listening. I have to go do some social reproduction work right now. Um, As do I and probably several others. Thanks so much, Jed. Really wonderful. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, more discussions of these kinds in various forms. So yes. thanks to Peggy and ACS and Gish. This is great. Yes. Thanks, everyone. And for everyone uh, who's listening, we will be back in the springtime with another session of, of these uh, partnership between ACS and LPE on uh, on 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 big topics in in law um, tied towards uh, courses if you're in law school or some of the main uh, areas of law. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, for now, uh, you can go to lpeprojects.org or acslaw.org to learn more about LPE and ACS. And we'll look forward to being in touch um, and seeing you again uh, in the springtime. Thanks. <laughs>